My dear friends in Christ, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first spiritual conference, we are using as a theme the Holy Family, the individuals, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So our first lecture was on Jesus, and especially the importance of having a proper understanding of our Lord, and that is to understand both his mercy as well as his just judgment. So today we go on in our second conference to speak about our blessed, our blessed mother, our blessed lady. And what a wonderful theme, what a privilege to speak about our blessed mother. We read on many of the feasts of Our Lady, the epistle is taken from the Book of Wisdom, and there are several different ones that are used, but one of them, the church putting these words written of wisdom into the mouth of Our Lady, they who explain me shall have life everlasting. So that when we talk about our Blessed Mother, when we strive to promote a devotion to her, a knowledge of Our Lady, that she is very pleased with this and will reward it. St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori, in his wonderful book, The Glories of Mary, which if you have never read, that should be at the top of your list of a book to read, The Glories of Mary by St. Alphonsus. But he says in the introduction to that word that if our tongue were employed every day, all day long, speaking of the praises of Our Lady, it wouldn't be too much. And if every member of our body, like our eyes and ears and fingers, etc., if every member were turned into a tongue to praise Our Lady, it wouldn't be as much as she deserves. And let us remember that St. Alphon- uh, Thomas Aquinas says something very interesting. He said, God could have always done better we might say, than what he has done, except in two instances. In other words, God could have created a more beautiful world if he wanted to. He could have put into the world more extraordinary creatures than he did. He could have created more stars in the heavens than he did. He could have always done more, except in two instances, that he could not have created a more perfect human nature than he did for his divine son, Jesus Christ. The body and soul, the human nature that was created for the Son of God was perfect and was created specifically for the incarnate word. And then the other creation in which God could not have surpassed himself was in creating the most perfect human creature that he created, our Blessed Mother. He filled her with extraordinary graces so that our Blessed Mother was holier at the beginning of her life when she was yet in the womb of her mother, St. Anne, and again at the time of her birth, that Our Lady had more grace, more holiness than all of the saints that have ever lived combined and put into one lump sum. Our Lady had more grace at the beginning of her existence than all of the saints put together, and yet she continued to grow in grace. When our Blessed Mother at the Annunciation heard the message of an angel, it says that she was afraid. The angel said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. Now, why did Our Lady fear? There are different reasons given by theologians, but what is the greeting? What are the first words that the angel said to her when he appeared to her at the Annunciation? He said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And then it said that our Blessed Mother kept pondering what these words might mean. And then the angel said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God and thou shalt bring forth a son, etc. But notice the first words, hail, full of grace. To be full means that Our Lady had so much grace at that moment that God could not 
pour any more grace into her soul. Our Lady was always full of grace. How then did she increase in grace? Is that her capacity kept growing and growing. It would be like if you take a cup, an eight ounce cup, and you pour it full of water and you get it right up to the brim where if you were to put one more drop of water, it would flow over the side. Then you could say, indeed, that cup is full of water. But then if you were going to take another cup that's a 12-ounce cup, and you fill that up to the point where one more drop of water, it would overflow, that also is full of water. But it has four more ounces than the 8-ounce cup. So Our Lady's capacity kept growing. But at any given moment of her life, she was always full of grace. We know that our Blessed Mother was given by God many privileges. There is a theological term that is used, prerogatives. Privileges, a special unique grace is given to our Blessed Mother to fit her for her role of being the mother of the Redeemer. And among these was the fact that our Blessed Mother was conceived without the stain of original sin, immaculate, immaculate conception, immaculately conceived, and that she was always free from the smallest actual sin. Our Blessed Mother never committed even one venial sin throughout her life. She was always, again, full of grace and perfectly pleasing to Almighty God. And yet, this wonderful woman that God created to be his own mother has also been given to us to be our mother. And so we call her our Blessed Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, our spiritual mother. Now, during Lent, we meditate upon the passion of our Lord. We pray especially the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, reflect upon his agony as scourging, being crowned with thorns, all of the sufferings of his passion. But let us not forget also to reflect upon the sorrows of his mother. And you remember what are listed as the seven sorrows of Our Lady? The first one is the prophecy of Simeon. When our Lord was born in Bethlehem, Our Lady was filled with joy. But how quickly that changed. Forty days later, at the presentation of the Christ child in the temple, Simeon took the child into his arms and he looked at our Blessed Mother after he said his canticle, Now thou dost dismiss thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word in peace, etc. He turned to Our Lady and said, This child is destined for the fall and for the rise of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted, the sign of the cross. And, he went on to say, Thy own soul a sword shall pierce. Now what a unique phrase. Thy own soul a sword shall pierce. You think of a sword piercing a body, not so much something that's inanimate, a soul. But that indicates how deep was going to be the grief of our Blessed Mother at the time of the Passion. And indeed, her sorrow began at that moment because she knew the scriptures from the Old Testament. She knew the prophecies Remember those words of Isaiah, which, by the way, is a good thing to meditate upon during Lent. Take out your Bible and read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah the prophet. And that's the chapter where he speaks about our Lord as a leper. And there was no soundness in him, and he was led like a sheep before its shearer. So he did not cry out amidst his sufferings, and that by his wounds we are healed and so forth. Beautiful words of Isaiah, of our Lord and his passion. So Our Lady knew those things. And once, the, uh, once uh, Simeon said to her, thy own soul a sword shall pierce, she was reminded that this beautiful child that she held and caressed would one day be tormented and crucified. And that she would hold 
as she did at the foot of the cross, what we meditate upon in the 13th station, the body of our Lord taken down from the cross, and there she held in her arms the lifeless body of her son, and she could see the wounds at close range. And she thought of all the suffering that he experienced, and it renewed all of the sorrow and all of the pain that she experienced throughout his passion. And she thought about the times when she held that same body, when it was just that of a child in her arms. And now she held the lifeless body of her son. Now the fathers of the church, and by the fathers we mean those great writers that lived in the early centuries, such as St. Augustine or St. Gregory the Great and St. Ambrose and St. St. Gregory Nazianzen, and so on and so forth, all of these early writers we refer to as the fathers of the church, they call Our Lady the New Eve. Because you think about it, God's creation is perfectly ordered. There's a reason for everything. There's a harmony, there's an order, there's a plan in God's works. And so with our Blessed Mother, she has a very important role in the work of man's redemption. The downfall of the human race was brought about by a man and a woman who cooperated together in committing original sin. They both ate the forbidden fruit. And so the downfall of the human race was called was caused by the cooperation of a man and a woman. And so it would be fitting that the redemption of the human race, the restoration of the human race, the repairing of the harm that had been caused in the Garden of Eden would be brought about by the cooperation of a man and a woman. And so our Lord is the Redeemer and Our Lady is the co redemptrix. Now it's very important to understand what the Catholic Church teaches in this regard, and that is that Almighty God did not have any need for Our Lady's sorrows, for her sufferings to bring about our redemption. Everything that Jesus Christ did was infinite in value. He could have shed one tear or offered one short prayer to his Father And it would have been sufficient to redeem the entire human race. Or even if there were a hundred worlds that needed to be redeemed, it would have been adequate. But God wished to join with the passion and death of his divine son, the sorrows, the pain of a woman. It was fitting that she repair the harm that was brought about by Eve. So she is referred to as the new Eve and as the co-redemptrix. And so we should reflect during the season of Lent also on the sorrows of Our Lady, especially her sorrows during the Passion, meeting her divine son on the way to Calvary and seeing him so covered with wounds and so forth, standing at the foot of the cross, And St. Bonaventure said that, I believe it was St. Bonaventure, one of the saints, that if Our Lady wanted it to end, she's standing there at the foot of the cross, her son is dying on the cross, if she just simply said, Jesus, stop stop this, he would have come down from the cross, it would have been an end to his passion if she had willed it. So in other words, she willingly accepted the death of her son, the sufferings of of her divine son. She willingly joined her heart, her sufferings to his for our redemption. And it was especially there at the foot of the cross that she became our spiritual mother. As our Lord said to the beloved disciple, Behold thy mother. And he gave her to not just St. John, 
but he gave her to all of us to be our spiritual mother. So during Lent, reflect also upon her sorrows, and let us reflect today also upon her virtues. Now, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, in his wonderful book, True Devotion, talks about the 10 principal virtues of Our Lady. Our Lady had all of the virtues to their greatest perfection. Again, she was the most perfect human being that God created, and he could not have created a more perfect being than our Blessed Mother. He endowed her with so many graces, but Our Lady cooperated with these graces to grow to these great heights of virtue. And Our Blessed Mother is the perfect model, especially for women, to look at Our Blessed Mother, her modesty, her purity, her piety, her humility, her sweetness, all of her virtues. She is our model to look to Our Blessed Mother and think, I want to try to imitate Mary. I want to try as, as best I can to be like her. We all can do that, but especially women should look to Our Blessed Mother as their model to imitate. We live in an age when this modern, radical, feminist movement has so undermined the proper Christian concept of the role of women. And it is indeed tragic. Modern thinkers, sociologists, and so forth would say to us, well, the difference between boys and girls, besides any biological difference, is purely a social construct. And that society, going way back to the Middle Ages or whatever, has determined the roles. And so we need to throw that off. We need to overturn the apple cart. We need to change it. And so you hear about these moderns, these particularly radical individuals, who don't even want to raise their children as a boy or a girl. They want to let the child determine its own gender. Gender fluid. They have all these modern terms. And you think, how sad, how absolutely ludicrous and absurd. But of course, it, become, it comes about because they deny the creator. You believe in evolution. You believe that man is just like another animal, but maybe a little more advanced than other animals. Then you could see how that might happen. And then you get these parents who will name their children a name that is not particularly masculine or feminine, because again, they want the child to determine. And certain individuals who are prominent, maybe they're actors or political persons or whatever, who will brag about how they're going to raise their child in such a way that they're not going to refer to the child as a boy or a girl and let the child choose, and they come up with new pronouns now. It is all so absurd. And I, I think to myself, it is so sad to see there are those who, these feminists, who congratulate themselves and they're so proud, they're so happy when a woman is the first one to do this or that or the other thing. They try to take the role of a man and the first woman to do this, the first woman to do that. They celebrate it. Isn't it wonderful? And they want to teach girls to try to choose the role of men, what had traditionally been male roles in society insofar as the workplace and so forth. And if you think back, not that far back, less than 100 years ago, it really was World War II that began women in the workplace. Women were in the home. And it was because of the war effort that women began working in the factories and then it just never changed after that. Now, I'm not condemning where there may be a situation where a wife, a mother, has to have a, a job because the needs of modern society, one income, isn't quite enough to raise the family. But on the other hand, you think about how 
really foolish it is when mothers give their children to someone else to raise, they take the children to daycare because they gotta have their career, and someone else is raising their children. Of course, when they get home in the evening, they're tired because of working and they've gotta make a meal, etc., and don't have the time with their children that nature intended. And when I say nature, I mean God, because God is the author of nature. So all of this changing of the roles trying to redefine women wanting to become like men insofar as the role. But if you look at women, if you take an objective view of women, all of the women in this church know what I'm saying is true, that there is probably no drive in a woman stronger than motherhood. God created women to be mothers. You think of religious sisters, they truly are spiritual mothers. They teach children, and it never ceases to amaze me the dedication that our religious sisters have in the classroom. They spend all of their time and effort in helping these children and preparing their classes because they love children. They are mothers, just spiritual mothers. And even a woman who chooses for her vocation in life, what is a wonderful vocation, and that is the single life. Maybe should it, she would have wanted to get married, but there wasn't an opportunity. But for whatever reason, there still is that motherly instinct. Have a, ro a room full of women, four or five or ten, and another woman walks in with a baby, and what happens immediately? All the attention is on the baby. Why? Because women have no more strong, no stronger instinct than being a mother. And they use that female quality to help others in so many ways. You have women who are nurses, etc. And I, I say this because, for a couple reasons, first of all, because we want to be very careful we don't get sucked in by the foolish, false ideas of the world into what the proper role should be of a man or a woman. Like I said, everything is upside down. Women want to become more like men. Men in the world nowadays are constantly being knocked down to change their masculinity. Toxic masculinity. And they're becoming emasculated and feminine. And it's disgusting to me. We have a prayer. I found a, a booklet that was a holy hour written way back like in the 1930s. And it has a beautiful prayer in it. Praying for, is for a parish. May our women and our girls be merry-like and modest and pure and pious, etc. And then it talks about the boys and it says, let them be manly. Let them be manly. And I think of the modern Vatican II church and they have so many problems because they have so much rampant homosexuality among the clergy. And then they have women who are traipsing all around the altar. The women are Eucharistic ministers and they are lectors, etc. And this is interesting. I know, I imagine they have a station here, but there is a Catholic radio station or radio programs around the country, and I believe it's called Ave Maria Radio. Now, the Ave Maria Institute or college is in Florida, and it was started by the, the man who started Domino's Pizza, became a millionaire, and he sold the business, and then he moved to Florida and built this college and so forth and like a little community and so it's looked upon as being ultra conservative but Novus Ordo. So it would represent the conservative wing of the Novus Ordo. Now I don't listen to the radio but I have on a few occasions just listened for a short time and I can't listen to it because they'll pray the rosary and they always have women leading the rosary and it seems like so emotional. Hail Mary, full of grace as though that's going to make your prayer more powerful. And they have music playing in the background. 
And it just turns me off. What does St. Paul say? Women should not be leading prayers. Now, in the home, that's one thing. And by the way, you can look it up, St. Paul to the Corinthians. Women are not to pray in the church. And what that means is to be the leader of prayers. Yes, when you're praying publicly, you have a man leading the rosary, and then the women pray out loud and join in, or the prayers after Mass, or singing, by all means. But unless you had a situation like a convent school, you had a girl's school with sisters, then of course they're leading the prayers in the church. But that's right from St. Paul. But conveniently, just like they didn't notice the part where St. Paul says that women should have their head covered in church, they also don't notice that part. And so in the Novus Ordo Church, even in its conservative parts, the conservative element, I guess you could say, they still have the women Eucharistic ministers and the women lectors and women running parishes, etc. Because again, they've turned upside down God's plan. And then, then there are the men on this radio station, whether it's laymen or priests. And again, I, I'm just telling you the reaction I have, the few times I've listened, is you have men with that very soft, effeminate voice. And so it seems that even the conservative part of the Novus Ordo Church, they have been affected by our society. And we want to make sure that we are not, but that we follow the divine plan. And what's the divine plan for women? women? Our Blessed Mother, her modesty, her humility. Now sometimes women, mothers or wives, find themselves in a situation where they have to take more of a leadership role in the family. Maybe their husband has not been doing so, especially insofar as the faith is concerned. But we must remember what St. Paul also says, let women be subject to their husbands in all things. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. It's right there in St. Paul to the Ephesians. So what's the proper role in the family? The man is the head of the home. The woman, the wife and mother is the heart of the home. And here's a little bit of advice too. Because women sometimes, especially if their husband is not leading the family to God, is not leading the family in prayer, maybe has certain faults or qualities that the wife considers detrimental, don't get to the point where you're constantly fault-finding, constantly correcting, because you can, number one, not achieve your goal, but number two, make yourself odious to your husband or family by this constant negativity. It reminds me of what St. Francis de Sales says. You can catch more flies with a spoonful of honey than with a barrel of vinegar. That... Women who have changed for the better their husbands, who have influenced their family and led them to God. I think of someone like St. Rita or St. Monica or many other examples of holy women. They didn't find it, they didn't accomplish this by haranguing and constant fault finding and negativity, but by their prayer life, their meekness. And they became so lovable in the eyes of their husbands, even more than at the time they got married, that his love for them grew because of not just their beauty, but more their virtue. And to such a point that they would bring about a better state for their husband and family members by their virtuous living. Because virtue draws others. And a humble, meek request by a wife who's deeply loved will accomplish a lot more than a strong rebuke by one who has lost that deep love that the husband should have because of being negative and fault-finding, etc., nagging. So this is a role we think of our Blessed Mother. She was far holier than St. Joseph, by far. But the angel didn't appear to Our Lady in a dream and say, 
tell Joseph he's to take you and the Christ child and flee into Egypt, the angel spoke to Joseph. Why? Because he was the head of the Holy Family. And we'll talk about this in the next conference on St. Joseph. And that is that husbands who recognize their inferiority in virtue compared to their wife must not, for that account, fail to fulfill their responsibility with the family. Because St. Joseph was the head of the Holy Family, even though he was far inferior to Our Lady in virtue and holiness. He did not, for that reason, fail to fulfill his duty as the guardian, the protector, the head, the head of the Holy Family. So women are blessed to have our Blessed Mother as their model. Meditate on her virtues. Reflect upon our Blessed Mother. I mentioned that St. Louis Marie de Montfort lists the ten principal virtues. And among them would be her profound humility, her faith, her ardent charity, her angelic sweetness, her divine wisdom, and so forth. Her patience. All of these wonderful virtues. Pray to Our Lady to become more, more and more like her. And let us all remember that our Blessed Mother is the mediatrix of all graces. Just as she was and is the co-redemptrix, a title which she earned at the foot of the cross on Calvary, so she is called by Holy Mother Church the mediatrix of all graces. Because God, who could give his graces directly to us, nevertheless wills that his graces be dispensed by Our Lady. She can give to whom she wills as much as she wills of the grace of God. She is our spiritual mother, which we see in Our Lady coming to Lourdes or Fatima or other times to warn, to admonish her children, to remind us that we must live Christ-like, Mary-like lives, amend our lives, and that the punishments that come in the world, such as war, are a result of sin more than of some bad political decision. Sin is the ultimate cause of the evil in the world, of all the evil in the world. Sin is the greatest evil, and we must constantly seek to conquer sin. That is what Our Lady came to La Salette or Lourdes or Fatima to, to teach and to remind us. So she is our spiritual mother. She is the mediatrix of all graces. And it is by our devotion to Our Lady that we will persevere. St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori says, perseverance in grace is the grace of graces. It is the greatest grace. Because just because you have been a faithful Catholic for what? 10 years, 20 years, more? That doesn't mean we have made it. That doesn't mean we're going to be in heaven one day. We have to persevere in living our faith. We want to pray every day for the grace of final perseverance. That we will persevere right up until the end of our lives in loving and serving Almighty God. And it is Our Lady who will give us those graces. Never let a day pass without praying the rosary. Five decades at least of the rosary which Our Lady requested at Fatima. Pray the rosary every day, she said to the children. It has never ceased to amaze me that when new people come, like to different, par different ones of our parishes, and I meet new people, and you know they leave the Vatican II church or whatever, they come and they want to be received into the church, if they need to be received into the church, receive the sacraments, and they really are converted. And you begin talking to them, oh, I started praying the rosary several months ago. I've been praying the rosary every day. It always seems to be a theme that they were praying the rosary, and so they were given the grace to see the truth. Another thing that oftentimes happens is you find someone who picked up the book 
by St. Louis Marie de Montfort on true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is a book about consecrating oneself completely to Our Lady as a slave of love and to Jesus through Mary, a total consecration. And St. Louis asks that those who want to make this consecration spend a month, 33 days to be exact, of prayers and readings in preparation because it's very important. And again, I've found so many persons, they come and you talk to them and find out, oh, I consecrated myself as a slave to Our Lady two months ago, or whatever. And then they're given the grace to see the truth. Our Lady, you see, is the key. She always has been the mediatrix of all graces. But it's especially in our days that we need a strong devotion to our Blessed Mother to persevere. I've mentioned this before in sermons and so forth. A, a woman who was raised a Baptist, and she became a Catholic when she was about 60 years old. And I met her a few years later. And it's, very, it's almost amusing to me the way she explained it. She, she kept saying, they kept the Blessed Mother back from me. She was like angry at the Baptist preachers and so forth because she said they kept Our Lady away from me. But she called her the Blessed Mom. They kept the Blessed Mom back from me. Very simple way, but such a beautiful thing because how did she become a Catholic? She first of all began to understand who our Blessed Mother is and her role and that she is our mother. And she loved Our Lady and began to pray to Our Lady and then everything clicked and she became a Catholic. So we have in the Catholic religion, we have all the teachings we need, but we also have the teachings about our Blessed Mother, who she is, what she does for us, let us cooperate with those teachings. Let us love our Blessed Mother. Let us live our consecration to her. And let us especially, and women in particular, but all of us, always strive to be Mary-like. Because when we become like Mary, we are becoming like Jesus and being pleasing to him. And it is those virtues the virtues of our Blessed Mother, the virtues of our Lord, that we need to acquire to secure our salvation. Please kneel.